order. This morning, the Finance Committee meets to discuss three nominations for important roles in the Biden administration. First, January Contreras is President Biden's nominee to serve as Health and Human Services Assistant Secretary for Children and Families. This role is all about overseeing uh, programs that deal with caring for some of the most vulnerable people in our country, particularly the young. And I just want to take a moment, we're going to put my full statement into the record and say how pleased I am to have two uh, witnesses who are going to particularly focus on families first. Senator Crapo and I, working with Senator Hatch, really felt that was historic legislation. You know, the country was essentially, prior to the bill, faced with two choices. We'd have a kid in a foster home, some good, some not so good or we would have a kid at home in a situation that just wasn't acceptable, wasn't good for the child. You might have a parent um, with some alcohol challenges, drugs, you name it. And what Families First was all about was creating a third option, a third option that would really be good for kids. And that was why it was called Families First. So Senator Crapo and I have had a chance to be in public service a bit. This is one of the most historic bipartisan efforts I've been part of. So we're really looking forward to the uh, two of you that are going to work in those precincts um, to do a good job. Ms. Contreras has championed the safety and well-being of women, children, and families. She's led Arizona Legal Women and Youth Services. I noted we had a joint kind of uh, almost a shared DNA around legal aid. I ran the legal aid program for the elderly. So very glad that you and then, of course, Ms. Gaston, we claim her as one of ours because we, we brought her out west and she's been doing great stuff with us um, in Oregon. She is uniquely qualified. Both of you, in my view, give public service a good name and uh, we're really looking forward um, to hearing from you this morning and before she came west. Ms. Gaston served as the executive director of the Maryland Social Services Administration. And what I really liked about my conversation with Ms. Gaston was she was pure passion in terms of getting families first spread from sea to shining sea. I think you told me, uh, Ms. Gaston, in our discussion, we're at 14 states, I think, right now, but a lot of the rest of them are moving very quickly, and that's good. Uh, Mr. Gordon is President Biden's nominee to serve as HHS Assistant Secretary for Financial Resources. He's worn a lot of hats during his time in public service. He served as Director of the Department of Health and Human Services for the state of Michigan, uh, played a key role in the pandemic response there, supervised thousands of people, budget of $27 billion. He worked at the U.S. Department of Education, the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, he also was... Uh, a senior uh, official at uh, the New York City Department of Education, a law clerk for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the White House aide, an experienced, um, savvy public servant in all respects. And uh, when you're working on finances at HHS, the core of your job, of course, is upholding what around here we like to call the guarantee of Medicare. I mean, Medicare is not a piece of paper. It's not a slip. It's not some kind of voucher arrangement. It is a guarantee. And we're very proud around here that we updated the guarantee. Again, as Senator Crapo and I talk about in a bipartisan way with the chronic care bill, which recognized that Medicare today is no longer primarily about acute care. It's primarily about chronic disease, cancer, and diabetes, and heart disease. So you can expect that we'll be uh, very interested in your views on that. Uh, as always, Senator Crapo and I work on these matters in a bipartisan way, and I recognize my colleague. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Today's nominees will have significant responsibilities overseeing programs that affect some of the most vulnerable populations in America. As Assistant Secretary for Financial Resources, Mr. Gordon would have a critical role in stewarding resources across the breadth of HHS's programs. I look forward to hearing his views on how HHS can improve its service delivery to provide more effective care in programs that affect nearly every American. If confirmed, Ms. Contreras and Ms. Jones Gaston would oversee programs that protect and support children and youth. I'm eager to hear how these nominees propose improving service delivery toward these particularly at-risk groups. I urge all the nominees to be forthcoming in this discussion and in all questions for the record. 
and should they be confirmed in roles which they have been nominated to uh, as they move forward. Congress is a critical partner to the work of the Department of Health and Human Services and the programs you oversee are of unique importance. Working in a bipartisan way with the members of the Finance Committee, we have the opportunity to evaluate and implement policies that better serve the American people. Once again, I congratulate the nominees here today and look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Senator Crapo. Now, we'll have some opening statements from each of you, and then we have a uh, set of formalities that we have to go through with respect to some questions. Mr. Gordon, why don't you go ahead? <coughs> Thank you, Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, members of the committee. Thank you for considering my nomination to be the Assistant Secretary for Financial Resources at the Department of Health and Human Services. I'm honored by President Biden's decision to nominate me, and if confirmed, I look forward to serving under the leadership of Secretary Becerra. Before beginning, I'd like to thank my family for their love and support. Here with me today are my wife, Catherine, and my older son, Silas. Government funding decisions each day make an enormous difference to millions of Americans in every corner of the country. For all of our sakes, government must run as effectively and efficiently as possible. If confirmed, I will use data, evidence, and evaluation to deliver results, strengthen program integrity and transparency, and advance equity. This has been the work of my career across three decades, in the federal, state, and local governments, in leadership roles handling health and human services, and in managing budget and finance matters. For more than four years, I served as a senior official at the U.S. Office of Management and Budget, including as acting deputy director. At OMB, I played a key role in launching evidence-based initiatives at four agencies. One of these was HHS's Maternal, Infant, and Early Child at Home Visiting Program, which now funds 19 service delivery models supported by solid evidence. Together with HHS leadership, including the official in the role for which I'm nominated, I also worked on developing the Head Start Recompetition and improving programs for the aging. In this period, I also helped to negotiate bipartisan budget agreements to keep the government open and the country from defaulting on its debts. And I had particular responsibility for program integrity investments to reduce waste, fraud, and abuse. The private and nonprofit sectors offer important lessons for government. After leaving OMB and becoming the senior vice president of finance and global strategy for the college board, I worked as part of a team to reform procurement processes, cut costs, and drive technology changes that improve services for schools and students alike. That experience informed my work as the director of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, an agency with 14,000 employees and a $27 billion budget. With extraordinary colleagues, we responded to COVID effectively, expanded access to health coverage, drove improvements in child welfare programs, including implementation of Families First, increased use of effective approaches to mental health and substance use disorders, and cut technology costs while improving customer service. One of my happiest accomplishments in Michigan was ending severe delays in the delivery of Medicaid and SNAP benefits. When I arrived, the state had just rolled out a flawed new system, which meant that more than 30% of Michiganders in some rural counties were not receiving needed help within the legally required 30 days. Legislators in both parties were angry, and rightly so. We listened to frontline staff, improved technology, shifted work patterns, and held ourselves accountable with a public dashboard showing our results each week. Within a few months, rural counties were performing as well as others, and we went on to simplify and improve the delivery of benefits in ways that earned national praise. Should I be confirmed, I'd apply the same performance focus at HHS. The work of HHS has never been more important, and it's never been more personal for me. Among more than 900,000 Americans who have died from COVID was my father, Alan Gordon, a psychiatrist who spent decades working on behalf of homeless individuals and ex-offenders. He taught me to believe in the dignity of every person and the honor of public service. I would be honored to play my part as HHS's chief financial officer in sustaining a robust COVID response and in strengthening so many vital HHS programs from cancer research to the Indian Health Service, 
of course, to Medicare. Should I be confirmed, I would work with President Biden, Secretary Becerra, and members of Congress to fund health and human services programs that work. Thanks again for considering my nomination. Thank, I'll look forward to your questions. Thank, thank you, Mr. Gordon. And I always, you know, feel uh, as we reflect on COVID, it just comes back to people and families and all those people that we miss so much. So just know our sympathies are with you, and I'm, I'm sure it, it is reflected in your determination to do this job well. And uh, and we want you to know that we sympathize. Okay, I also want to say, <clears throat> Senator Stabenow very much wishes she could be here. She has a uh, important agriculture committee hearing that she chairs, but she wanted me particularly to convey a strong, warm welcome to Mr. Gordon. She had the opportunity to work with Mr. Gordon during his time as director of the Michigan Department of Human Services, including on the uh, expansion of the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics program in the state. And we think Senator Stabenow's work on that has really been historic, a big breakthrough. So Senator Stabenow wants the record to reflect that she very much appreciates your excellent work and looks forward to working with you at the department. Ms. Contreras, please. <clears throat> Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, members of the committee, thank you for considering my nomination to be the Assistant Secretary for Children and Families. I am grateful to President Biden for nominating me for this role and if confirmed, will work diligently each day under his leadership and that of Secretary Becerra. Before beginning, I would like to thank my family. Here with me today are my youngest son and my sister. And watching from home are my wonderful husband of 27 years, my oldest son who's in college, the woman who shaped me, my mother, and all of my Fontes family back in Arizona. Also, my proud dad, his wife, and my brother in Missouri. And without a doubt, watching over my shoulder are my nana and tata, my maternal grandparents, who I carry in my heart each day. I am always grateful to my family for supporting me in all that I do. Growing up, I was fortunate to learn the value of service and hard work from my own family. My grandfather was a paratrooper in World War II. My grandmother raised 11 children on a shoestring budget. I was born on Bergstrom Air Force Base in Texas, where my father served. And by the time I was a toddler, we moved to Arizona, where my family has lived for generations. My parents both began long careers at the US Postal Service. And they worked the second shift for most of my childhood. This meant my grandparents pitched in to help until I was old enough to stay home by myself. And when I was 11 years old, my sister was born. And my very first leadership role was launched a couple years later when I began taking care of her, cooking her dinner and tucking her in every night. Being responsible for my sister's well-being gave me a deep sense of purpose that has stayed with me throughout my 25 years of public service. My public service career began as a prosecutor in the state of Arizona. I went on to serve as an assistant director in our state's Medicaid agency, one of the most cost-efficient, high-quality Medicaid programs in the country. I also served as a member of Governor Janet Napolitano's staff and later cabinet when I led the Department of Health Services. In each of these roles, collaboration was key. I work with diverse, bipartisan stakeholders, including state, local, and tribal leadership, advocacy organizations, healthcare providers, faith-based organizations, and government contractors. I value my state agency experience because it's where I learned to manage large organizations, large budgets. It's where I learned how to bring talented teams together to achieve common objectives. And most importantly, it's where I learned the heavy responsibility that we have in these roles to deliver results that make a difference in the lives of people. In 2013, after a long career in government, I founded Arizona Legal Women and Youth Services. We go by always. It's a legal aid organization that provides life-changing legal services to some of the most vulnerable people in my home state. 
The mission of ACF mirrors the mission of always. The people we served at always are the same people that the administration for family and children. Children in foster care, young adults who have transitioned out of foster care, youth who are homeless, unaccompanied children, and survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking. The mission of ACF is my professional mission. If confirmed as Assistant Secretary for Children and Families, I will work with the talented men and women of ACF to prioritize prevention and family well-being, including strengthening supports for grandparents and kinship caregivers. Congress laid a new way forward with the passage of the Family First Prevention Services Act. And I would work with colleagues in and outside of the federal government to live out the promise that Family First envisions. Throughout ACF programs, I would lead with a commitment to reduce racial disparities and build equity, and to lift up whole family and community-based strategies to increase safety, financial stability, and economic mobility for kids, youth, and families. And that includes accessible childcare. Each time I have been entrusted with the responsibility of stewarding public resources and executing mission critical services, I am grateful. And each time I remain focused on the faces entrusted to serve children and youth and families who need allies to help them thrive, trafficking and domestic violence survivors looking for safety and security, families with low income looking for help to keep the lights on. If confirmed as the Assistant Secretary for Children and Families, I will remain focused on the faces ACF has been entrusted to serve. If confirmed, I am ready to get to work with every ACF colleague and partners across the country to carry out this important mission. Thank you for your consideration of my nomination. I look forward to answering the questions that you have. Thank you, and thank you very much. And I particularly appreciate your coming back to legal aid and your work there. I think about my time when I was uh, director of the legal uh, services for the elderly program in our state, and when I would go out to our offices, which were far flung, a number of them in rural areas, I was struck by how often um, whoever was seeking legal representation came with their family. You saw it in those kind of waiting rooms. So um, I appreciate uh, your background. I think it is a real plus for you in this uh, consideration of this, uh, this uh, appointment. OK, we're now ready for Ms. Ms. Gaston. and. Uh, what a, what a thrill to have somebody we have decided to proclaim to be an Oregonian from this point on. Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, members of the committee, thank you for your consideration of my nomination to be the Commissioner of the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families. I am honored by President Biden's decision to nominate me for this role, and if confirmed, Look forward to serving children, youth, and families under his and Secretary Becerra's leadership. Before I begin my testimony, I would like to thank my family. Here with me today are my children's godmothers, friends who have become family, and watching virtually are my son and daughter, my mother, and many of my family, friends, mentors, and colleagues. With me in spirit are my ancestors, and my birth parents. I would not be here today without the love and support of all of these people. I was adopted at a very young age after a number of foster care placements and grew up in a small Iowa farming community. Throughout my career in human services and child welfare, I have infused my lived experience and the experience of others into my work because I believe that those who have been served by children and family services systems should have a role in changing these systems. If confirmed as a commissioner of the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families, I would prioritize shifting the focus of child welfare systems from placement to prevention by promoting cross-system partnerships and shared outcomes and helping states implement the Family First Prevention Services Act. Leading from the ground up, 
by keeping the perspective of states and those with lived experience at the fore. Ensuring equity and inclusion are at the center of all that we do. I've been working in human services and child welfare for almost 25 years. During that time, I have transformed child welfare systems under both Democratic and Republican governors. I've worked across the nation to recruit foster and adoptive parents, have implemented innovative policies and programs, and have sat side by side with families and youth being served by these systems as a person with lived experience, as a parent, an advocate, and a social worker. As a result of my personal and professional experiences, I know that transforming ch children and family services into family well-being systems that serve children, youth, parents, and families as a whole cannot be done without collaborating with public and private partners, tribal nations, communities, and faith-based partners, including those with diverse perspectives. I currently serve as the Director of Child Welfare at the Oregon Department of Human Services. Together with my team and community partners, we developed a strategic plan focused on well-being and prevention that has already yielded results. Despite the onset of COVID-19 pandemic, we have reduced the number of children in foster care by more than 20% over the two years and are on a path towards long-term change. I led similar change efforts as the head of the Social Services Administration in Maryland, where I served under the leadership of Republican Governor Larry Hogan. In both Maryland and Oregon, I successfully led the state's Family First Prevention Services Act plans from development through federal approval. If confirmed, I will prioritize supporting states to fully implement this landmark law so that children, youth, and families do not have to wait any longer for the transformational change it offers. In addition to Family First, there are a number of other levers at the federal level to support states who are working hard to be innovative and improve how they meet the needs of children, youth, parents, and families. However, the key word here is support as it is also important for the federal government not to put up unnecessary barriers. Transforming children and family services systems into family well-being systems cannot be done without a focus on equity and inclusion. In these systems across the nation, we see disproportionality at every decision point. This impacts rural communities, communities of color, and tribal nations, and other vulnerable communities. In these communities, we often see limited access to services, resources, impacts of poverty, and disparate outcomes. To build towards well-being, I have heard from those who have experienced a child welfare system that many families and youth could have been supported earlier by meeting needs related to homelessness, child care, and access to other concrete supports, such as addressing family violence prevention, mental health, and substance use needs. If confirmed, I look forward to continuing to be a voice for those who have experienced these systems and leading transformation to better meet their needs. Thank you for the opportunity to share my work and vision. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Gaston. And uh, at this point, I'm going to put into the record a uh, number of organizations have sent letters to uh, Senator Crapo and I. And, uh, by unanimous consent, we'll put them into the record right uh, at this point. Um, now we have some formalities, and uh, I think you all have been advised on these. First, and we'll just go right down the row, is there anything that you're aware of in your background that might present a conflict of interest with the duties of the office to which you have been nominated? Mr. Gordon. No. Second, do you know of any reason, personal or otherwise, that would in any way prevent you from fully and honorably discharging the responsibilities of the office to which you've been nominated? No. No. Third, do you agree without reservation to respond to any reasonable summons to appear and testify before any duly constituted committee of the Congress if you're confirmed? Yes. Yes, Senator. Yes. Finally, do you commit to provide a prompt response in writing 
to any questions addressed to you by any senator of this committee. Okay, we're uh, <clears throat> going to get into some questions, and Senator Crapo and I will start this off. First up, Ms. Gaston, I think I heard you say, but I want to make sure we get it for the record. You're already on the way to getting, I believe you said, over 20% uh, reduction in foster care placements in Oregon. Yes, Chairman. In Oregon, over the last two years, we've reduced the number of children in foster care by 20%, about 1,000 children. Very good. And, uh, and our state really likes the idea that we're getting out in front on, on this. This is an area, as you know, where we've had a lot of problems historically, and we want this turned around. Now, not all the states in the country are as far along as we have come with your uh, leadership. You've led two states through the process of development and implementation. So as you and I talked about, we want to surge that progress. We want to have dramatic uh, advancement in the number of states on your watch that uh, pick up on Families First. Tell us a little bit, you and I talked about it, about your kind of game plan to, to do that. Thank you, Chairman. First of all, it is to be able to talk with the team. Um, if I'm confirmed, um, that is within ACYF and ACF. And then also listen to the states around what the experience has been and where are the um, possible hurdles and things and what is needed to be able to actually help move forward and get approvals for those plans that are actually already submitted and under consideration. And then working with the states who have not yet submitted to identify what the concerns are, what the issues might be, and um, identify how we might be able to support having um, all of our states be participating in the Family First opportunity. Now, we talked also uh, about increasing transparency so that everybody can work towards this goal of having a system that's really based on hard evidence, hard evidence that something really is working in terms of implementing Families First. How do you see that uh, going forward? Thank you, Chairman. Transparency is absolutely important. Um, I think being able to have good open communication with the states and the families that we are working with, with yourself and members of Congress in the partnership and collaboration, all of the work that um, we do absolutely depends on the ability to partner and collaborate and, and identify solutions and strategies for meeting the needs of children and family to move towards transparency. That includes um, data, information, evidence, making sure that we've got the practices and services in place that actually meet the needs that children and families have in the way that they need them to be delivered and supporting being able to have those added into our toolkit per se um, for providing those supports to families and children. Good. <clears throat> I want to move on, but uh, I also want to note that you worked uh, with a Democratic governor. You worked with a Republican governor. Senator Crapo and I talk about this often. In human services, it's about what we can make work and what we've got to look at anew because it's not coming through for our families and our, particularly our kids. So I just want to note that for the record. And uh, uh, we wouldn't have allowed you to leave Oregon uh, unless it was to achieve more of what you have been building in Oregon. And uh, I'm very pleased that uh, we're having a chance to consider your nomination today. I intend to support you fully. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Uh, Ms. Gaston, um, you too will be involved in Families First, and uh, I think I've pummeled this subject with both of you um, previously. Tell us a little bit about the first steps you would take to address racial equity in this position. This has also been an important part of the committee's work, you know, on prenatal care, for example. We've just been just stunned at how uh, minority moms, black moms in particular, have just not been able to get the kind of services that you see in affluent white suburbs. And we're very much committed to turning around uh, these issues where uh, on so many measures, uh, racial equity just is something you talk about but you don't deliver on. And that's what we want to change. So tell us your first steps um, with respect to 
how you'd proceed and, and if you have any suggestions for us in terms of what we could do to achieve the goal. Thank you, Chairman, for that question. And thank you for your leadership and the leadership of this body uh, in passing Families First and in being brave enough to say we need to move from intervention to prevention, that we need to support families and their well-being. If confirmed, what my priorities will be in this area is to make sure that as we move forward, as we're building prevention into everything we do at ACF, that that is done with an equity lens. I think where my approach, if confirmed, would be is to, number one, make sure that we're talking to a lot of diverse partners on the ground, uh, states, nonprofits, families themselves, uh, and make sure that there are more people at the table. Number two, when we look at ACF um, and who's in the room and who's at the decision table, that we are making sure that youth who are impacted, uh, professionals who have been personally impacted by the child welfare system are at the table, and that um, those professionals are bringing diverse perspectives and diverse backgrounds. Three, in my home state, I come from a state with 22 tribes in Arizona. There is a lot of opportunity for collaboration with tribal governments and tribal communities to make sure that we're addressing uh, racial disparities. I met with a, a juvenile judge and an attorney general of a tribe not too long ago, and they were sharing more about the pilot program they've started, which is sharing data, which is not being afraid to share that data so they, they can actually look at at zip codes and look at where do families need the most help so that we can reduce the number of placements. Uh, that's the kind of work that needs to happen and if confirmed, I look forward to working with you to make sure that we are making equity a priority. Thank you, Ms. Contreras, and I gather that I may have called you Ms. Gaston at one point and I apologize for that's that. That's okay. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Your, thank you for your thoughtful answers. Senator Crapo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gordon. As Assistant Secretary for Financial Service or Resources, you would play a critical role in ensuring the efficient use of our taxpayer resources. Uh, HHS has the largest budget of any federal agency, uh, totaling nearly $1.7 trillion for fiscal year 2022. A budget of that size requires careful oversight, and we're currently emerging from an unprecedented public health crisis which some have argued requires what could be described as spend now and validate results later. Uh, I'm concerned about that, and uh, I just want to ask you to respond uh, to uh, your commitment to reviewing the department's programs to determine where we do have waste, fraud, and abuse of taxpayer resources and what can be done to strengthen that review going forward. Thank you for that question, Senator, and, and you have my commitment to take with the utmost seriousness the responsibility to make sure that dollars are spent as effectively as possible and that we are always minimizing waste, fraud, and abuse. I've done that throughout my career. So I think there's multiple ways we can do that, including in the context of the pandemic. I talked a little bit about performance management. The, this office is responsible for the, the department's performance management and metrics. And I think setting metrics, being publicly accountable for results, making adjustment in real time. That's a meaningful approach across multiple dimensions. I think using evidence and policy making. I talked a little bit about the maternal McV program, which is, requires the use of evidence. I think that's a program we should, a, a, an approach we should use more often in government. And lastly, with respect to waste, fraud, and abuse, it's, it's been a commitment throughout my career to address that. When I, when I arrived in Michigan, um, one of the, the, I asked for only funding increases in only a few areas, but one of them was for the department's inspector general to address challenges with waste, fraud, and abuse in, in the state's Medicaid and SNAP programs. We need to do it in a way that's sensitive to legitimate claims. It doesn't put up undue barriers, but it's always a challenge. And uh, ASFR plays a key role in marshalling the department's resources against uh, erroneous payments, and that's something I would be committed to act on if I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed. Well, thank you. I appreciate that commitment and that focus, and I uh, appreciate your, your uh, record of being able to do that kind of thing. So thank you for that. Ms. Contreras, uh, you mentioned there are a number of tribes in Arizona. There's a number of tribes in Idaho, too, so I completely uh, identified with your comment there and appreciate your focus on collaboration uh, in that context. Uh, I've long been a champion of the uh, McVie program, which expires at the end of this fiscal year. 
It uh, supports evidence-based home visiting services for at-risk families with young children. And home visiting programs have been proven to help prevent child abuse, neglect, and improve maternal and child health and promote child development. I know you understand all of that. Uh, as you are aware, McV is administered by Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, in collaboration with the Administration of Children and Families, or ACF. My question to you is, as we work on reauthorizing the program, do you have any reforms or suggestions that you would recommend to us now to help even improve it? Ranking Member Crapo, thank you for that question. Uh, when we're talking about home visits, it's a perfect example of the creation of a gateway for families to a universe of services, to a universe of supports for them. Uh, and that's really a model that we need throughout our work, where there are more gateways for young families, for parents who, um, who are looking for those supports and who need them. As we move forward, if confirmed, um, I certainly am committed to collaborating with HRSA uh, HRSA is an important partner, and it makes sure we, that we also reach our rural areas, which is important. Um, I think the kinds of reforms my approach would be to recommend is that we're working together to, again, build in that equity lens so that there are no families left behind the, in terms of having accessibility to, to home visits, um, that we are doing our part to make sure that the entire suite of services that are available through ACF to support families and children is part and parcel of what they are introducing uh, to families. It, it's really a, a part of a larger strategy um, that this administration <clears throat> is committed to, to again, build prevention, to build family well-being. Home visits are an important part of that, and if confirmed, I look forward to working with partners on that issue. Well, thank you, and I'm about out of time, but Ms. Jones-Gaston, I did want to note, as uh, Senator Wyden mentioned, that it was impressive that you've worked with both Republican and Democrat governors and have a strong record. Uh, the question I have for you, I'll submit for the record, but it focuses, in fact, this is a question that you'll probably get to, Ms. Contreras, but it focuses on uh, how critical it is for us to work broadly as we administer these programs for children. Um, and uh, how you feel about the importance of working with faith-based providers as they play a role in the child welfare system. But I'll submit that for the record. And Senator Crapo, either of you, would you care to answer it? Yeah, if, if you would. I, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. I'd uh, be happy to, um, Ranking Member Crapo. Uh, I've had lots of experience throughout my career in partnering with faith-based organizations. I think when we're talking about the well-being of children and family and communities, we need everybody um, working together to create a safety network for our vulnerable populations, and faith-based partners are, are part of that. Good. I appreciate that. And, and I won't go on to Ms. Contreras, but I will put it in my questions for the record for you to respond on that as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Senator Crapo. And your, your point with respect to faith-based providers, very much respects, um, uh, very much uh, aligns with our views here as well. We're going to need everybody. I mean, there are just too many young people, too many families falling between the cracks, and I, I thank you for that. You. Senator Cortez Masto, uh, I believe she's online, and then Senator Whitehouse, um, it will be next to strong advocates for kids and families. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to the ranking member. Uh, thank you all of you to the nominees for your willingness to serve in these critical roles at the Department of Health and Human Services. Miss um, uh, Jones Gaston, let me let me start with you. As you know, the pandemic has been um, incredibly difficult across the child welfare space. Uh, we've seen communities hit hard by the twin economic and public health crisis, and many are still dealing with COVID-related obstacles workforce challenges and exacerbated health conditions. Uh, this has been difficult, not just for kids and their families, but also for the frontline child protective service workers who go above and beyond every day. So my question for you is what initiatives are there at the federal level to support caseworkers uh, with mental health and other services so that they, they are able to deal with the very difficult things they experience as part of their job? 
Thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, and, and you are absolutely right. The, the impact of the pandemic has been um, really profound um, for the families that we're serving as well as for the workforce that are serving um, these families. Um, first of all, you know, thank you to the congressional body for the funding that was provided for, and the flexibilities provided for the resources needed to be able to serve children and families and our young adults um, experiencing um, the variety of things that um, came up unexpectedly during, during the pandemic. And to our workforce, um, the, the gratitude I have for the continuing to show up every day and um, put their own selves at risk by continuing to make sure that we're working with children and families and keeping child safety at the forefront. It has absolutely been difficult, and I look forward to working with partners across the organization and members of Congress to really continue to look for ways that we continue to strengthen our workforce, provide the services and supports that they need to be well um, in order to be able to do the important work of serving children and families. Thank you. So let me ask you this, given the, the pending reauthorization of 4B, are there opportunities but within that act that may help address this issue for our uh, frontline workers? Thank you, Senator. The 4B uh, funding is incredibly helpful for states to be able to meet a variety of needs, including uh, the services for children and families, the flexibilities of being able to do things that might not be covered by Medicaid or other funding streams, as well as thinking about what is the what are the wellness things that are in place for our workforce and being able to help support them through this. In Oregon, we have been able to um, implement a trauma-informed response when workers experience trauma in the workplace with a child or a family that they're working with so that there's immediate support going to them and to their uh, colleagues to be able to work through their trauma again to, to be able to do the important work that they do. And so I look forward to being able to explore a variety of different ways that we might be able to support that at the federal level. Thank you. Uh, and now, Ms. Uh, Contreras, it's great to see you again. Congratulations uh, on the nomination. One of my top priorities um, here at the federal level is to make sure that our federal partners are working constructively uh, with the states and counties on the front lines who are doing all they need and can to meet our children's needs. I, I'm hoping that you can speak to your experience at the state and local levels and how it will inform the way you will approach uh, these new federal roles. Thank you for that question, Senator Cortez Masto, and wonderful to see you as well. My experience at the state and the local level is really what brought me here to, to this moment today. Um, it's always been about who we're serving. And in, in this case with ACF, such a sacred duty that we have here to protect the safety and the well-being of families and children. Um, in my own experience, being at the state Medicaid agency, um, we had a, a lot of collaboration. Uh, we had a chance to be very innovative, to use demonstration waivers that are available, uh, and a lot of work with our federal partners as well. So for me, that experience really comes to bear uh, I guess in part because I've been that end user um, of a state working with federal funding. Um, but then also when I had the chance to work at the Department of Homeland Security, uh, again, where were the gaps? Um, being able to listen to the community, being able to listen to staff who um, have ideas that have been, they've been ready to have implemented, uh, it's a very unique opportunity to figure out how do you keep making things work better. In this case with ACF, uh, you've done the great work as, as Congress to pass Families First, which gives a very unique uh, and landmark opportunity to build new systems to support our states, to support the workforce um, that you just asked about, to support the partners on the ground, uh, and make sure that we do our part to make it as as I don't want to use the word easy, it's not easy work, but that we're providing technical assistance, we're providing resources, we're showing what are the best practices um, and the data that we're building the systems around. 
Uh, and so for me, that, that's my approach. That's the experience that I bring with me. Um, and if confirmed, it's what will help me make sure that I'm working together with, with Congress and with our partners and the families and children and youth that are most impacted. Thank you. I know time is up. I will submit the rest of my questions for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, uh, Senator. And I, I just want to reference the point uh, that the Senator just made with respect to state and local governments being involved in human services. As the Senator knows, she's from Nevada and Oregon, we're thousands and thousands of miles from Washington, D.C. And so often, you know, our constituents feel Washington, D.C. might as well be Mars for all the real connection it has with the nuts and bolts of their lives' challenges. So I really appreciate Senator Cortez Mastow asking, as she has often, about the relationships with the states and the fact that you both are going to have them front and center. And for Westerners, it's just, it's a lifeline. We're just so far from Washington. Thank you. Okay, Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, and welcome to the panel. Um, a little background, I suppose, is in order. I have been a um, vigorous advocate for healthcare delivery system reform for quite some time. When we were doing Obamacare, um, I was a very strong supporter of the ACOs and of CMMI. Um, I had a weekly meeting with the uh, reform advocates to make sure we got everything from a reform perspective that we could into that bill. And at the end of the day, we found that we really had gotten everything we felt we could into that bill. And however toxic the conversation became about Obamacare between Democrats and Republicans, those reform measures have been relatively non-controversial. And they've been extremely successful. In particular, in Rhode Island, two of the best ACOs in the country have flourished and done an amazingly good job. And they are actually driving down per member per month costs, not, you know, slowing the curve of increase, driving it down. Um, so I think my confidence in delivery system reform has been rewarded uh, by results. And certainly in the Obama administration, that became... Um, emblematized, if that's a word, by the so-called triple aim. And we're continuing to, you know, pursue that triple aim. We kind of came off focus a bit during the Trump years, but technical people at CMS and HHS continued progress, and it was a non-controversial area, and actually some of the ACOs flourished there. Uh, this work, to me, is a big deal as Medicare closes in on insolvency, because if we can save a lot of money in Medicare by having healthier patients, that seems like a pretty obvious stratagem to fo strategy to follow. And so it's really important to me that Medicare and Medicaid continue their role of leading away from fee-for-service towards the triple aim and towards examples that prove this. That background connects to progress we've been trying to make in Rhode Island with respect to what is sometimes called end-of-life care and that is sometimes called advanced care. There are payment rules in Medicare that are idiotic and harmful as applied to the end-of-life care, advanced care population. Things like having to spend a couple of nights in the hospital before you can get into a nursing home when you may be a week or two away from death and the reason you need to be in the nursing home is because your family just can't cope with some of the things that are happening. Um, not allowing for in-home care in those circumstances. It's bad for the patients, it's bad for the families, and it runs up the bill. So it's not the triple aim of good, 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 it's stupid, 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 and perhaps even stupid and cruel, stupid and cruel and stupid. Um, and we've been working on trying to solve this for a very, very long time. And we've been working with CMMI through now four, I want to say, directors to try to get approval to let this go forward as the kind of pilot that CMMI is supposed to have. And um, it's not entirely Ms. Fowler's fault. She's obviously a veteran of this committee. 
Um, but I'm tired of Groundhog Day and having to start from scratch every time there's somebody new. And I'm tired of an organization that seems to have no capacity to listen when something like this that seems to be a huge win is put right in front of it. So this is, I guess, I, I think Mr. Gordon is going to oversee some of the CMMI stuff, so I guess I'll ask him for a response in the form of a question. But my real audience is the Sherpas here to fire a flare into space saying that I'm tired of not being listened to on this subject and of having a blank wall to deal with when there's no real contest on the merits. It's just, we don't want to listen to you. We don't want to do it that way. We might think about doing it some other way some other time, and we're just not here to listen and not here to help. I've been through too many rounds with CMMI for that to be acceptable uh, any longer. And interestingly enough, actually the best engagement we had was with one of the Trump CMMI leaders. So let's see if we can improve on that, and I'll let uh, Mr. Gordon answer briefly, but I've used all my time, so please make it briefly. Thank you, Senator. Um, I hear both your passion and your expertise around the issue. I, I had the good fortune earlier in my career during the transition to work with the CMS administrator and the CMMI administrator and would look forward to talking with them about these issues. You know, my own experience, not, not getting into the details of the rules involved, which I don't know, is, of course, that increasing access to home-based care can be better for people and better for budgets, and that uh, alternative payment methods can uh, yield better care uh, and cost savings, and that going upstream with medical care, creating incentives for our health system, not just to treat people in the doctor's office and the hospital, but to improve the conditions in which they live every day and to work with them on exercise, nutrition, housing, clean air, clean water, those two can yield better health outcomes and, and savings. So uh, completely agree, and I'm sure... The Give us the chance in Rhode Island, and we will prove it for this very vulnerable population. Thank you, Chairman. Thank, thank you, Senator Whitehouse. We now have Senator Bennett. We're also glad to be joined by Senator Warren, uh, TBD, with respect to others. But um, let's go with uh, Senator Bennett. Thank you, Chairman Wyden. Can you hear me? Yes. And Thank you, Chairman Wyden, and thanks, Ranking Member Crapo, as well, for holding this hearing on nominations to fill these critical roles at HHS. I want to thank Mr. Gordon and Ms. Contreras and Ms. Jen Gaston for your willingness to serve and work to care for our nation's children and families. Um, Ms. Contreras and Ms. Jones Gaston, both of you will have important roles overseeing programs that take care of our nation's most vulnerable children. For years, I've worked alongside Senator Wyden and Senator Grassley to write and pass the Family First Prevention Services Act. The same to modernize our nation's child welfare system and support kids and families at risk of entering the foster care system. And although states are moving forward to support these families, they are still encountering barrier, barriers specifically on how the Prevention Services Clearinghouse is approving programs. Colorado has also shared its concerns on the slow timing and back and forth with regional offices simply to have plans approved. Where do you see opportunities to enhance oversight and engagement with states and tribes to ensure that children and families across the country are receiving the support we promised them to stay together? Do you, do you, why don't you go ahead and please answer that? Thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, it is absolutely critical that we um, find ways to be able to support states being able to implement this important um, legislation so that we are preventing preventing maltreatment and preventing the utilization of foster care as our only path to to serving children and families. Uh, there's been a lot of information that's been gathered, I know, over the last year from states in regards to the experience of the clearinghouse. I think the other important information that's been gathered has been um, from the providers who are submitting information to the clearinghouse for consideration. So um, I am committed to working with yourself and with the team, if confirmed, to be able to find ways to um, get the 
evidence-based practices um, into our clearinghouse, make sure that they are the services that are needed for the diverse populations that we serve across this country, and work with the states to be able to really get the uh, prevention plans submitted, approved, and implemented so that children and families um, are getting what it was intended from the Family First Act. Okay, we look forward to working with you on that. And Ms. Contreras, I don't know whether you've got an, an additional answer to that, but let me ask you a different question and you could you could add to that. I, my time is short. Ms. Contreras, I, I applaud your interest in serving one of the most in one of the most difficult positions. And if you're confirmed, you've got a lot of hard work set out for you. One of your responsibilities will to care for be to care for the 9,600 unaccompanied children that are under the custody of HHS. As I've mentioned before in this committee, the previous administration almost did everything in its power to dismantle our legal immigration system. It cut important services for kids in the government's custody. Hundreds of kids were separated from their parents under the last president's policies and were never reunified, which remains a challenge under the current administration. In the past month, we begin to see the number of unaccompanied, uh, unaccompanied kids in HHS custody start to increase again for a number of reasons, not under your jurisdiction, but you are ultimately responsible for caring for them once they're here. I'm disappointed that we haven't seen a proactive public plan from the Biden administration on what they're doing to best serve these children. If confirmed, will you commit to establishing a public strategy on caring for unaccompanied children and sharing that with me and the rest of the Congress. In the meantime, could you speak to this broader set of issues? Senator Bennett, thank you for that question. If confirmed, my priority is the safety of children and the well-being of families. That includes all children. That includes our children who are in the unaccompanied children program. Uh, I'll share that I have represented unaccompanied children as their lawyer. Uh, I have trained OR staff and providers in the past. Uh, this is a world that I know, and I know that there are many partners out there who want to work with us to make sure that we are caring for children in a way that adopts best practices from child welfare. Um, and that, that will be my priority if confirmed. It is to, number one, make sure that we're watching the data that we're planning. Number two, to make sure that we are trying to build systems that adopt the best child welfare practices. Number three, we're keeping these kids safe the whole way that we do that. And number four, we are then reunifying them with family or placing them safely with a vetted sponsor as soon as we can. Those are my goals. You have my commitment to working with you and all partners um, in achieving that. My time is up, but do, do you think that you have the funding to be able to fulfill the responsibility that you just described? Senator, thank you for that question. Uh, if confirmed, I certainly do commit to following up with you on funding and um, sharing any input on that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you for your outstanding work for kids all these years, Senator Bennett. So we've got members, it's a hectic day coming and going. We're gonna make and lock in the next three, Senator Grassley, Senator Warren, and Senator Hassan. Senator Grassley. Thank you very much. And I, I wanna explain that I wasn't here for your testimony because I was across the hall as ranking member of the Judiciary Committee. I'm gonna start with Ms. Kurt Contreras. Uh, Congress passed the Family First Prevention Service Act in an effort to focus federal child welfare resources in keeping families together. The expectation is that this will result in fewer ch uh, children entering foster care. However, the primary goal should be to improve the safety and well-being of children who are at risk, um, not simply to lower the number of kids in care. If confirmed, how will you work to ensure that the department is tracking safety and health outcomes for children that are impacted by Family First? Thank you for that question, Senator, and thank you for your leadership and this body's leadership on passing Families First, which is a very important piece of legislation that it, when we live out its vision fully is going to make a big difference and is making a difference now for families and children. Uh, my priorities, if confirmed, are to make sure that we are collaborating with states 
uh, counties, tribal governments, that we are collaborating so that we're providing technical assistance and resources to help them put those plans together, to help those plans get approved, to ensure that we are making the clearinghouse a robust source for states of best practices, programs and services that work for a diverse families, pr programs and services that are culturally competent. Um, and it's collaborating across HHS and across government. Uh, how can we work better uh, within HHS? How can we work better with HUD uh, to provide services, to collaborate, and at least to communicate to families on the ground all of the, the ways that uh, this Congress has passed and the administration is living out to support families and children? Um, so those are my priorities. Uh, if confirmed, I look forward to being a partner with you, with states, with tribal governments, and with our partners on the ground to make sure that we are supporting families and children and trying to keep them safely together. Yeah. For Ms. Gaston, across the country, including my state of Iowa, there's a shortage of foster parents. Uh, this has caused a very unsuitable placement for children who need to enter foster care. Uh, many foster parents choose to stop fostering after only one year, and most say that they didn't feel supported by the agencies. So how would you, if confirmed, approach improving the retention rates of foster parents? Thank you for the question, Senator Grassley. And first, I'd just like to acknowledge and thank you for your service to Iowa. As a child of Iowa, um, uh, it is a pleasure to see you before uh, today. Uh, Foster parents have a very difficult job. They are critical to our work in child welfare in partnering with us in caring for the children that come to us, oftentimes with experiences that have give, lay out trauma and um, add to challenges that they have. And so it is critical that we support our foster families, that we recruit families that um, diversely represent the children and families that we're serving and that we are looking for ways to be able to support them. In my experience, um, I've been able to work really closely with the foster parent associations in each of the states that I've served in Maryland and Oregon and identify really a feedback loop so that as the agency we're getting information um, from directly from those that are serving with us to be able to identify where are the places that we have improved needs for improvement, what are the things that are working. The other th important piece is we need partners. Uh, and so partnering and collaborating with community, with organizations to also wrap around the support that foster families and the children that they're serving as well as their families um, is really critical to being able to create, again, a safety network um, that is also inclusive of our resource families and foster parents. Uh, last February, this will be my last question. Last February, Secretary Becerras went before our committee. He was asked about being responsive to questions that we would ask him. He committed to Chairman Wyden that he will be prompt in answering questions by any senator of this committee. Uh, Secretary Becerras told me in writing, quote, I will provide prompt responses in writing to requests from any members of the committee. Uh, unfortunately, this has not happened. On June the 10th, 2021, uh, at the budget hearing, Secretary Becerra's, I submitted questions for the record, including about rural health and my oversight into COVID-19 origins. In total, 20 senators asked 181 questions. Last week, we got answers to these questions. 237 days later, this is not a prompt response. I can understand it takes time to respond, but HHS needs to be responsive or, re, or respond. So I guess instead of asking each of you separately, you see the problem we have, and I hope you can overcome this and be more responsive to our uh, questions. The gentleman's expired, Senator Warren, and then Senator Hassan, and uh, we also have a great champ for children who's come, Senator Brown. We'll go with Warren Hassan um, next to, uh, for what we just announced, Senator Warren. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all. 
for your willingness to serve and for being with us here today. I wish I had time to talk with all of you about, about your work, but I want to focus in on one issue in particular. Ms. Contreras, you're nominated to serve as Assistant Secretary for Children and Families, and that means that, if confirmed, you will oversee a number of important programs at HHS, including Child Care and Head Start. Now, millions of American families right now rely on child care providers so that parents can go to work. And millions of children are in child care where they get a chance to play and learn and grow. But our child care system is in crisis. Things were bad enough before the pandemic with millions of parents unable to find quality child care that they could afford. But now COVID has forced more than 10,000 child care providers to close their doors and thousands more to reduce capacity. Even with record job creation this past year, the child care industry is still down 136,000 workers compared with early 2020. 7,000 child care jobs evaporated just during this latest Omicron wave. So, Ms. Contreras, may I ask, a child care shortage means that it's even harder for families to find a center with an open slot for a child. But does it also have an impact on what child care costs? Thank you for that question, Senator Warren, and thank you for your leadership on this issue. Uh, I agree with you that child care costs, uh, they're a challenge for American families. I've represented many struggling young mothers for whom child care is simply not within reach. When we look at the cost of child care, I think one thing that we've seen is during the pandemic, um, there were too many, there are too many child care providers who are struggling and too many who, if not closed, as you mentioned, are facing closure. Um, I believe one study that I read showed that um, providers have seen nearly a 50% increase in their costs, in part due to um, the pandemic, and that's since the start of the pandemic. We, we have to do better. Um, you have my commitment, if confirmed, that I will be working with you, a partner, working with providers on the ground to support their workforce and to support providers so that we're making sure that we are taking care of the people who are taking care of our kids. Well, I very much appreciate that. You know, the numbers are just really awful in this area. Um, HHS considers child care affordable when it costs no more than 7% of a family's income. And yet the median family, that's the family right in the middle, that's using child care right now is paying 25% of their income. Think about that, more than three times what HHS deems as affordable. So families are paying more for child care. And let me just ask, has the cost of providing that care gone up during the pandemic, Ms. Contreras? Thank you, Senator. I, I think they go both in hand. That's what we've seen, that the cost of child care and even the availability of it are greater problems than they were before the pandemic. Um, but also that we're seeing that providers are, they experience these very high increases in the cost to them. Um, and our job uh, is to make sure we have a stable child care sector for, for kids and for parents. Um, and, you know, you have my commitment to work with you on that so that we're, we're speaking with providers on the ground, we're helping them to support their workforce, and that we're building stability into that sector. So families are paying more. Child care centers are spending more on things like masks and tests, uh, uh, their ratios of, of, of uh, uh, supervisors to children. Uh, and, and yet, child care workers are not making any more money. In fact, for many of them, they make more money if they left and went to Walmart than they will working at a child care center. One survey found, this has real consequences for families, one survey found that to save money on child care, 94% of parents had recently resorted to reducing work hours, switching jobs, or leaving the workforce altogether. So let me ask one last question, see if we can do this quickly. There's a lot we need to do to invest in child care in this country. Are you worried that if more help doesn't come quickly, we're going to see more centers 
closing their door, and even fewer children and parents who have access to high-quality, affordable child care. Senator, we do have to get to work to make sure that we have a stable sector, and we need to put the supports there. You have a partner if confirmed. Good. We need to make big investments in child care. That's part of what Build Back Better is all about, and it's time for us to get this done. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. And the, the senator makes a number of important points, and she and I have talked about it in a sense, and I guess Democrats don't use this word very much. We're also supply-siders. We need to create a bigger supply. And then some of the other points that Senator Warren um, correctly points out, so we'll be following up on that. Um, the next um, members per a tentative agreement is Senator Hassan, then Senator Brown, Senator Casey, and then Senator Cassidy. And I think that's been agreeable to uh, all sides. Senator Hassan. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. And I just want to start by thanking you and the ranking member uh, for this hearing and to all of our nominees. Thank you so much for being willing to serve and thank your families too, because this is a, a family effort, I know. Uh, I want to start with a question to Ms. Jones Gaston. Good morning. Um, one of our greatest societal responsibilities is to keep our children safe, a responsibility that all too often goes unmet because of systemic failures. Recognizing this, it's essential that child welfare agencies make improvements. In your current role as child welfare director in Oregon, you've overseen major system reforms and set an example for what other states may want to consider to improve their own child welfare systems. If confirmed, how will you help states improve their child welfare agencies so that no child falls between the cracks? Thank you for that question. The systemic change is absolutely needed, and it's possible, and it can't be child welfare agencies alone. It has to be in partnership with health, with education, with Medicaid, with community partners to really build um, the supports around families and communities so that ultimately we're preventing maltreatment um, so that children are safe and not harmed. And then for the response system that Child Welfare Agency is, when there is a safety concern, being able to make sure that we've got a workforce that is skilled, um, that we have um, partnerships and services available. Congress has provided a number of supports um, throughout the pandemic that we've been able to use flexibly and being able to meet some of the uh, unexpected needs of families and children that we're serving. And it is... Um, paramount that we are also in partnership with other departments and organizations in this body as we continue to try and solve the complex challenges that children and families and communities are facing, ultimately with the focus of child safety and family well-being at the forefront. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you. I think one of the issues that is kind of perpetual is that adults tend to focus on adults when we set policy, and we really need to put our kids first, and I would really look forward to working with you on that. Um, I want to follow up uh, on Senator Warren's line of questioning with you, Ms. Contreras, about our child care system, our deficits, what we need to do. And I just want to drill down on one area because I agree with Senator Warren's analysis uh, I'm hearing from constituents all over New Hampshire about the difficulty of finding childcare, about the expense when they do, um, and about the difficulty that certain kinds of work schedules pose too uh, in terms of aligning a childcare, a reliable, stable childcare setting uh, with somebody's work obligations. But I wanna drill down on um, what you think uh, could be gained, uh, if anything, um, if the Office of Child Care and Office of Head Start work together to increase access to early childhood education programs, are there ways we can strengthen that partnership uh, to really strengthen our overall child care system? Thank you for that question, Senator. Um, absolutely. Uh, part of the approach, if confirmed for me, is to make sure that we are trying to break down silos throughout ACF and throughout HHS, but yep. in particular throughout ACF. We have incredible services and programs available to families and to kids on the ground. Um, and we're not always presenting that uh, through gateways where they're aware of all of the supports that are available. When we talk about early ed and childcare, um, 
those are systems, or, or we're, our goal is to build systems, right, to support systems um, that have diverse providers, that we're communicating with them, not just with the state, but with the providers directly, uh, and trying to really build the, the supply, as was just yeah. mentioned, really trying to build accessibility and support providers in a way that they can support their workforce, those, those people that are taking care of our kids, and that we can make sure that they can afford the expenses um, of staying in business so that families have somewhere to go and that they can afford that. Well, thank you. And I want to follow up with one final question on the same issue generally of child care. But we know the importance of early intervention for the overall development and success of young children with disabilities. Unfortunately, the pandemic has resulted in many infants and toddlers with disabilities not being identified and has delayed getting necessary supports and services to children. I recently introduced a bill that would increase funding for the early intervention services under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act to better support infants and toddlers with disabilities and their families. I realize I am over time, so I'll ask you to be very brief here and we can follow up, but if confirmed, how will you ensure that families are connecting with the right resources and supports for their young kids with disabilities? Thank you for that question, Senator. Uh, briefly, um, at home in my home state, I worked um, in our Medicaid agency's assistant director and at our state uh, Department of Health Services overseeing um, some of the partnerships that were linked to this specifically. Um, what we need to do is make sure we're talking to our state and local governments that we're listening, not just talking to understand what they need to support the families and the kids in their state. And that's my commitment to you if confirmed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank my colleague and look forward very much to working with her on, on her bill. So I'm very, very important. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'd like to start with uh, asking a question of your constituent, uh, if I could. Uh, Ms. Jones-Gaston, and thank you for our conversation the other day. Family First created the QRTP, the Qualified Residential Treatment Program, to, to ensure children being cared for by families could access appropriate residential treatment. This policy reflects recommendations from individuals with lived experience in the foster care system who have experienced trauma from institutional phenomena. Uh, CMS has issued guidance to clarify that the Medicaid IMD exclusion rule applies to QRTPs with more than 16 beds, as you know. Uh, there's been confusion in my state regarding which providers are eligible to receive federal Medicaid dollars. Our office continues to get outreach from QRTPs asking for clarification, and that's where you come in. So um, how can ACF and CMS work together to clear up any remaining confusion to provide clarity for states like Ohio and others and to ensure the integrity of the QRTP model so that youth and group care can get the evidence-based trauma-informed services they need and you know, perhaps bring in your experience implementing that model in Oregon and Maryland. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. The, the issue is complex, and it is absolutely uh, necessary for us to be partnering across CMS, child welfare, um, within the department. In Oregon, uh, the partnership that um, I've had with the Medicaid director as well as our health department has been critical to trying to uh, both identify the appropriate services and the service array that children with complex needs have and need, and also do the problem solving around how do we actually make sure that we are in compliance with the, the federal requirements as well as our state statutes. My commitment is to work with CMS, if confirmed, and others, and hear from states around what are the questions and the challenges that are being faced, and find some resolution for um, being able to provide the clarity that's needed so that states can fully take advantage of family first, and most importantly, children are able to get the services that they need in the manner that they need to get them. Thank you, and um, I plan to vote for your confirmation, and we will work on that, those issues together. Uh, my other question is for Ms. Contreras. Um, nice to see you, and thank you for the conversation earlier. Research shows that racial disparities occur at nearly every major decision-making point in our child care system, from disproportionate suspected maltreatment reports to child protective services investigations to home, home to out-of-home care placements. There are a variety of factors that contribute to this disparity 
poverty, as we know, including higher rates of poverty in underrepresented communities and including structural racism. Last week, ACF published various resources regarding its commitments to advancing racial equity for all and including preventive services um, as a means of improving family well-being, decreasing potentially traumatic interventions and building some kinds of family resilience. The Family First Prevention Services Act has helped, encourage, has helped to encourage this important shift towards prior, prioritizing prevention services. My, my questions, I'll, I'll ask two questions together, and if you would answer, how do you work to, how will you work to address these systemic disparities that exist in the child welfare system by improving prevention services through Family First, and how can Congress aid these efforts as we work on Title IV-B reauthorization? Thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, prevention is um, the, the vision that this body passed uh, through Families First, and I, I thank you for your leadership in passing Families First as a body. Uh, when it comes to equity, as you mentioned, ACF recently did um, make a commitment around equity. The racial disparities that occur in child welfare, child welfare systems and in other systems um, around ACF are issues that we need to address. Uh, number one, we need to pay attention to the data. We need to collect the data in the right way in working with state partners. Um, and we need to pay attention to it. We can't be afraid to look away. And number two, we need to support states in understanding, here are some best practices. Here's what's happening in this jurisdiction that's a, very, that's a, that's a program that's really working, whether that's uh, working with grandparents, kinship, whether that's working um, with communities in other ways. Uh, number two, we really need to make sure that we are building a diverse workforce, um, people who have different experiences, different lived experience, to, so that they're at the table. Um, that brings new partnerships, new relationships, people who don't know they could be applying for grants in the past but are providing very exceptional services um, coming to the table. For, from my perspective, it's not taking our eye off the ball uh, you also mentioned about, uh, you, excuse me, you asked about our prevention services and the reauthorization that's coming up. Uh, if, if confirmed, my commitment is along those same lines. It's prevention. It's how do we help states understand all the services that are available? How do we help states understand what works? How do we support them in taking advantage of all these services at a time when as we discussed earlier in this hearing, they're experiencing workforce shortages and have a lot of issues themselves from the pandemic. Uh, you have my commitment, Senator, that I will be a partner with you in this work, that we will take racial disparities on, that we will look for creative ways um, that people are working on this across the country, and that we will make prevention the center of what we're doing because family well-being is the direction that we are committed to moving forward. Thank you, Ms. Contreras. I plan to support your nomination, and we'll work together. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Brown. And the nominees should know when you say you'll make kids the center of your work, that's been the center of Sherrod Brown's time in public service. So thank you so much, and I thank my colleague. Okay, we've been calling some audibles, and what we're going to do now uh, with the agreement of, uh, of the members is we'll have Senator Casey, Senator Thune, and Senator Cassidy. And I think Senator Casey is online. Senator Casey out there in cyberspace? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thanks very much. And I wanna thank each of the nominees for their commitment to public service. It's never been more important to have committed individuals doing the work that you're all doing for children and families and so much else. But I wanted to start um, with uh, a question that I'll direct at both uh, Ms. Contreras and Ms. Jones-Gaston. Uh, regarding your, your roles overseeing a number of vital programs that relate to both children and families. As you know, children flourish when their needs across multiple domains are met. I outlined in early 2020 the five freedoms for America's children, the freedom to be healthy, the freedom to be economically secure, the freedom to learn, the freedom uh, to be safe from harm, and the freedom from hunger. And as you know, within the Administration on Children and Families, there are a number of programs that support these needs for children, including Head Start, child care programs, child welfare, foster care, family violence prevention, and so much else. And I, I, here's my basic question. In your roles, how would each of you work 
to build bridges within HHS itself, as well as build bridges among states and community organizations that you fund so that they can better coordinate programming for both children and families that they serve. Maybe we'll start with Ms. Contreras. Thank you, Senator, for that question. If I can start with an example, because it is exactly what you're talking about. I've represented many trafficking survivors in my career. Uh, I will give you the example of the first trafficking survivor I served. Her mother had serious mental health issues. Her father had serious substance abuse issues. She went to the foster care system. Ultimately, uh, after several placements, she ran away from a group home, which is when she met her trafficker, who she thought uh, was her boyfriend, and quickly it became apparent he was not, and she was in a violent situation for uh, a couple of years. I think all the things that you're speaking to and the promise that lives in Family First is to follow her journey. How could we have supported mom's substance abuse? How could we have supported, excuse me, dad's substance abuse? How could we have supported mom in her mental health issues? How could we have worked to make sure that, uh, that she didn't have a traumatic experience in a group home? And the good news is the homeless and runaway youth system that this Congress supports found her. The good news is the trafficking grants that you have um, at ACF funded my, my organization to provide legal services to her. So the good news is, is we're meeting um, kids, young adults, but our job and my priority, if confirmed, is that we're meeting them sooner and that we're not forgetting that the, the, real, the real opportunity we have um, is to support those parents from day one when, when we can tell that they may be entering a crisis. And if confirmed, you have my commitment to work with you on that. Uh, thank you again for that question. Thank you. Ms. Jones-Gaston? Thank you, Senator. Concrete supports are absolutely needed for um, meeting the needs and the collaboration across agencies, organizations, and communities for meeting these needs. We know that um, almost half, if not a little more than half, of the families that become involved with child welfare become involved with because of reasons around neglect. And those are oftentimes connected to consequences of the experience of poverty. And so being able to work with the organizations and agencies and departments, as well as with congressional members like yourself, to get those concrete supports to the families and children that need them so that we are preventing maltreatment, preventing the unnecessary involvement with a child welfare agency and moving into deeper into a foster care system. Young people who are experiencing homelessness, family violence, all of those uh, issues are critical and the concrete supports to be able to help resolve some of those challenges are, are, are needed. The other thing that I would just mention briefly is the, um, the, the partnership and hearing the voice of those young people, those parents, those families is also uh, critical to understanding what it is that's needed to be able to prevent maltreatment, prevent further involvement with child welfare systems and the experiences that people are having related to homelessness and violent, family violence. And I look forward to partnering with you and members of this committee in continuing to look for solutions in supporting our families and children. Well, thanks so much. What I'll do is submit a question as well for the record to you regarding infant plans of safe care and to Ms. Contreras regarding uh, domestic violence and some of the legislation that we're all working on. But Mr. Chairman, I want to turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Casey. And for our witnesses, Senator Casey also has had a long career of focusing on families and kids. So you're going to have a number of members on both sides of the aisle who are going to want to follow up with you. Senator Thune. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to our nominees for being here today. Uh, Ms. Contreras, as you know, federal employees on or near our southern border have been tasked with addressing historic levels of migrants, many of them have been taken into custody after crossing illegally outside of legal points of entry, uh, which has put a tremendous strain not only on the men and women of Border Patrol, but on the resources dedicated to the children who end up in the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement. 
And I don't mean to suggest that the unaccompanied children that are often trafficked to the United States are not vulnerable. But do you think that the services of ORR contribute to the pull factors of the unprecedented immigration pressures that we're seeing at the border? Thank you for that question, Senator. When it comes to ORR, uh, the responsibility of ACF remains similar to our responsibility elsewhere, and that's trying to protect the children, uh, their safety as they're in our care. Uh, in regards to the ORR program, what I'll be doing is trying to work to make sure that we are looking at the data. Um, there are influxes that happen in the referrals to ACF, and we need to be prepared for that. Um, and that will be my job to make sure we're keeping them safe and we are reuniting them with family or placing them with a vetted sponsor as soon as we safely can. Well, and I hope you'll look at the question of whether or not that is acting as a, an incentive and, a, and one of the pull factors associated with the number of people that are currently coming. Uh, at the same time, ORR is responding to the border crisis. Uh, you'll also be tasked with assisting a large population of Afghan arrivals. If confirmed, how will you deconflict the competition for resources, and will you ensure that resources are not, will not be steered from our Afghan security partners uh, in favor of the situation at the border? Thank you for that question, Senator. Uh, if confirmed to this position, it will be my uh, approach to make sure that we can keep moving forward on, on multiple fronts. That just comes with a job. Um, the ACF staff and the staff at ORR um, it takes those responsibilities uh, both very seriously, and it will be uh, my commitment to you that, that we are um, supporting Afghan refugees, the families, and the children that are coming to our care and working with our partners to provide the services that they need at the same time as we are fulfilling our responsibility to unaccompanied children. If confirmed, you're going to be tasked with overseeing the Office of Head Start and as you know, uh, last, late last year, Secretary Becerra published an interim final rule mandating that all staff and volunteers in Head Start facilities be vaccinated and wear masks, but they went beyond that. The rule, in my view, absurdly, absurdly mandates that children as young as two years old must also be masked while at the Head Start facility, including while outside on the playground. Um, I, I wonder what your view on that is. Uh, not even the World Health Organization recommends masking children under the age of five. According to their um, analysis and science and data around this, they say it just doesn't, it doesn't have the impact on safety for children under five. Uh, if confirmed, what will you do about that? Can, can, you, can you rescind this policy? There, it's obviously become a big issue for a lot of parents, administrators, teachers, um, and, and kids around the country. Thank you, Senator. A head start is a very important part of the responsibilities of ACF. And if confirmed, it will be my priority to work with states and localities and the providers on the ground to hear what they are experiencing, to hear how we can support them and their workforce. Um, because at the end of the day, the, the number one priority is yes, we're protecting the health and safety of children and families and staff. Also, that we're trying to help as many providers keep their doors open as possible in a safe way. And I would just urge you as you do that, you do examine that and you talk with providers and with the people, uh, you know, the stakeholder community, um, really encourage allowing these decisions to be made by the states. I just don't know why the federal government is wading into having children as young as two years old um, have a requirement, even when they're outside to wear masks. It just it doesn't make any sense, and even the World Health Organization, as I said, has come to that conclusion. Um, Ms. Gaston, South Dakota is a sizable Native American population. Uh, therefore, given your current role as Child Welfare Director for the State of Oregon, I imagine that part of your job includes interacting with tribal leaders and families about how best to address matters affecting the safety and well-being of children on Native American reservations. Could you just share with your committee um, if confirmed, how you would ensure tribal governments have a seat at the table, and more importantly, the needs of families and children across Indian country are always given consideration. Thank you for that question, Senator. Uh, in my time in Oregon, I've been able to um, uh, happily partner with the nine federally recognized tribes um, that uh, are in Oregon, and uh, they have had a, a seat at the table with us in the development of the vision for transformation, in the development of our Family First Prevention Services Plan, and in fact are working side by side with us 
in our implementation of that plan. And we're actually learning, um, as the state, learning from their example in many ways around the way in which prevention services are provided to the community and to families. And I uh, will continue, if confirmed, to be committed to partnering with tribal nations and tribal communities to make sure that the services and programs um, under my purview are um, uh, available, open, and uh, in conversation with tribal nations to make sure that the things that we're moving forward are in support of the well-being of tribal children and families as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank my colleague. Um, uh, I'm just going to make a very brief um, closing statement. I want to thank uh, both colleagues who are here, Senator Crapo and Senator Thune, because they've been part of the effort in this committee to focus in a bipartisan way. Families first was a historic development. And we saw already from Ms. Gaston the results, the 20% reduction in foster care placements and this third kind of option in Oregon and around, around the country. You wouldn't just have a kid in an unacceptable situation at home or going to a placement, a foster care placement that wasn't gonna work. You were gonna do something different. And families first was a bipartisan breakthrough. The chronic care bill, which we have referenced here today, where we would modernize the Medicare guarantee, which you, Mr. Gordon, are going to be able to play a pivotal uh, role in it, recognizing that acute care wasn't the only part of health care today, but we were dealing with chronic disease. And yesterday, Senator Crapo and I showed that the Finance Committee is going to try to move in a bipartisan way on mental health, which is urgent, urgent uh, business, because if we just go forward with business, usual, business as usual in the mental health field, we could lose much of a generation. So what you've had to say today and being responsive to members on both sides of the aisle today is very welcome. We'll look forward um, to considering uh, your nominations. I intend to vote for all three of you, happy to vote for all three of you. And I'd just like to thank all the members today for their participation. Uh, and regarding questions, for the record, the deadline for members to submit QFRs will be this Friday, February 11th at 5 p.m. That 5 p.m. deadline, I would say to colleagues, is firm. We want to thank everyone for their cooperation. And with that, committee's adjourned. <laughs>